Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, everyone. You sound like you're ready for a great, fantastic day today. Just waiting for a few more people to come in from the hallway, but we're going to get started. What a beautiful, blessed, bountiful morning it is today. I, I want to greet you this morning by saying good morning and welcome to Newark Beth Israel Medical Center's annual Women's Health Day. I am Atiyah Jaha Rashidi, the Chief Equity Officer and Vice President of Community Relations. All of us at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center and Children's Hospital of New Jersey are so pleased to welcome you all back to be here with us in person at the Marriott. How good does it feel to be in person again? We have an amazing day of activities planned for you, and our panel of experts are all excited to answer your questions and get this discussion started. So without further ado, I want to welcome to the stage our panelists. To the stage, Rashmi Agarwal. The Assistant Vice President of Network Management and Population Health. <laughs> Rebecca Kane, Assistant Vice President of North Beth Israel Medical Center's Advanced Heart Failure and Treatment Transplant Program and Cardiology. <laughs> Molly Fallon Dixon. Manager of Community Wellness Services at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center and Children's Hospital of New Jersey. <laughs> Board certified, I'm sorry, skipped one. D Dr. Matab, you're gonna help me out. <laughs> Atatole La, close enough, I'm sorry. <laughs> Phonetics. It's something that we all have to work on. As you heard, my name is Atiyah Jaha Rashidi, and so it takes a little bit to get all those consonants out, so I apologize. And we have her as the Director of Psychiatric Emergency Screening Services at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center. <laughs> then we have our board-certified obstetricianist and gynecologist, Dr. Nicola. Pemberton. And our Chief Pulmonary and Critical Care Fellow, Dr. Sophia Kutilani. And now, our guest moderator this morning is none other than the four-time Emmy Award-winning journalist and entrepreneur, Ms. Brenda Blackman. <laughs> Ms. Blackman was a familiar face on New York television as a news anchor and reporter for more than 30 years. She has authored two books, including Brenda Blackman, A Mom's Story, and donated every dollar from her book sales to support the Lupus Research Alliance, where she serves on the National Board of Directors. <laughs> Ms. Blackman also founded the Kelly Fund for Lupus, Inc. after her daughter Kelly was diagnosed with the illness. She is a health champion, and we are honored to welcome her this morning. I am gonna let Ms. Blackman take over this program in a moment. But first, we want to share a few words from our president and chief executive officer, who could not be with us this morning, but sends his well wishes, Mr. Darrell K. Terry, Sr. Good morning, and welcome to Newark Beth Israel Medical Center's annual Women's Health Day. I am Darrell Terry, president and chief executive officer of Newark Beth Israel Medical Center and Children's Hospital of New Jersey. And may I say, Thank you for joining us in person. It is certainly good to be back. I also want to thank our panelists and moderator for participating in this vibrant discussion about the issues that matter most to you. There are so many incredible things happening in our city and at the Bath. 
We just received our fourth world's best hospital recognition from Newsweek, and we have made a few changes in the last year. We now have a Starbucks kiosk in our main lobby. We renovated our parking garages. We recently opened a new 24-bed geriatric unit. And of course, Newark Beth Israel is under construction. In 2021, we started our Newark Strong project, a $150 million expansion of our facility that will include a new 17,000 square foot glass enclosed lobby, an expanded emergency department, a new intensive care unit, new operating rooms, and much more. We're excited about the impact this expansion will have on our hospital and in our community. Today, you will hear from a few of the expert clinicians at Newark Beth Israel who are dedicated to providing excellent care and committed to ensuring that you have the tools you need to be healthy. Once again, I wanna thank you all for joining us today and invite you to take advantage of all that we have to offer from the discussion to the breakout sessions to the information tables, and then go back home and tell a friend. There is something special happening at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center. Thank you. Something special indeed. Give all of yourselves a hand this morning. You look great. What a crowd we have this morning. And give a hand to all the people here, for all those people in those purple shirts that have Women's Health Day on them. Didn't they do a great job organizing everything? This is a wonderful event. And for everyone to be back here and everyone to be masked, and I'm so proud of you. <laughs> and I'm proud of the guests we have on the stage. These clinicians are something special. You heard their names, but I'm going to try to get through not only their names, but exactly what they do. So here we go. I've already apologized to them for any mistakes that I may make. Rashmi Agarwal, RN, BSN, MSN, APNC, FNP. That alone is impressive. I have more to say. <laughs> she is AVP of Network Management and Population Health at Newark Beth Israel, has more than 25 years of experience in clinical care and hospital administration. She has assumed several roles throughout her career, including bedside nurse, geriatrics nurse practitioner, and director of a Transitions of Care program. She is passionate about population health educating providers about new care models, and engaging patients around wellness programs. She graduated from nursing school in India and completed her master's in nursing in Buffalo, New York. Rashmi. Thank you, everyone. Rebecca Kane, DNP, APNC, BC, CCRN. You can applaud. <laughs> Rebecca is Assistant Vice President, Heart and Lung Transplant Pulmonary Medicine, Advanced Heart Failure and Ambulatory Cardiology at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center. She is committed to delivering patient-centered care and has spent her career developing successful patient-centered programs ensuring that patients have an exceptional, excellent quality of life and excellent outcomes once discharged from the hospital. She received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Rutgers University, a Master of Arts degree in Advanced Practicing Nurse from New York University, and a Doctor of Nursing Practice from Drexel University, where she is currently an adjunct professor, Rebecca Kane. Molly Fallon, Dixon, MS, RDN. You can applaud. <laughs> Molly is the manager of community wellness services at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center. She began her career in child nutrition education in both private and school-based programs. In 2014, she helped launch several social impact initiatives at Newark Beth Israel, including 
the Beth Greenhouse, the Reverend Dr. Ronald B. Christian Community Health and Wellness Center, and the Women's Wellness Pantry. She earned her bachelor's degree in nutrition and dietetics from the University of Delaware and her master's degree in health science from Rutgers University, Molly Fallon Dixon. Matab Ayatoli, Ayatoli, how did I do? Okay, <laughs> MSW, LCSW. Matab is a director of psychiatric emergency screening services at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center. She is a licensed clinical social worker with more than 11 years experience delivering trauma-focused therapy and social work services. She holds a BA in psychology from Rutgers University and a master of social work from the University of Pennsylvania, Matab. <laughs> Nicola Pemberton, MD, FACOG, and deliverer just this morning of another baby. <laughs> Dr. Pemberton is a board-certified obstetrician and gynecologist at Artemis OBGYN and the Birth Center of New Jersey, the first and only black-owned birth center in the Northeast. She's been featured on Netflix, The New York Times, and CBS Evening News for her dedication to reducing black maternal morbidity and mortality. I get emotional. She specializes in obstetrics, reproductive endocrinology, and benign adult and adolescent gynecology. Her training includes general laparoscopic and robotic GYN, surgery for procedures such as myomectomy, hysterectomy, and ovarian pathology. She performs numerous in-office procedures, including endometrial ablation, cryosurgery, colposcopy, and cone biopsies. Dr. Pemberton completed her undergraduate degree in biology at the University of Miami in Florida and attended St. George's University School of Medicine in True Blue Granada. Dr. Pemberton. <laughs> Sophia Quinton. Liani. Okay. <laughs> MD. You can applaud. <laughs> she is Chief Pulmonary and Critical Care Fellow at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center. Her clinical and research interests include diseases of the lungs and infectious diseases of the lungs. She joined Newark Beth Israel in 2016 and worked through the pandemic caring for some of the hospital's most critically ill patients. During her time at Newark Beth Israel, she has also collaborated on projects to improve access to care, streamline care delivery, and examine disparities in hypertension and cardiovascular disease among patients. She received her Bachelor of, Medicare, of Medicine and Surgery from University of Cape Town, South Africa. She completed her internship training residency at New Somerset Hospital, Cape Town, and her internal medicine residency at Newark Beth Israel. Sophia. <laughs> Did I miss anybody? Let's give all of our panelists a hand. Okay, I get to throw out the first question for all of our panelists. And starting with you, Dr. Pemberton, on the end. In one sentence, if you could only give one word of advice to the women in this room today, in one sentence and in one word, I don't know how that goes, but you, you're smart, you can do this. So, would you tell them what that advice would be? Good morning, first and foremost, thank you for being here. That's one sentence, okay. <laughs> um, and thank you for having me here as well. In one sentence, I think 
it all sums up to, and we have one of our panelists who can expand a little bit more, but I believe nutrition is everything. Regardless of what specialty that we focus on, um, whatever we have dedicated our lives for patients, nutrition really plays a role in all of it. Thank you again, everyone. My name is Rashmi, and I would say it in one sentence, believe in yourself and make it matter. That happiness, what you want for yourself, also spread that for others. So then whatever you do, it will be successful. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rebecca. Thank you so much for having me as part of this panel and part of this community day. Um, my one word I would say is to listen. And I don't mean it in the sense of hearing, but in the sense of awareness. Listen to what your body's telling you. Listen to what your mind is telling you. Most often when it comes to disease and progression, our bodies are letting us know way before any of us can diagnose what that is. So sometimes you have to quiet down to listen to ourselves. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Molly. I'm one of the dietitians at North Beth, and Dr. Pemberton stole my line, but that's okay. <laughs> but what I'd like to say is that prevention is really key. Uh, don't wait for that diagnosis from your doctor. Starting now, if you haven't already gotten started, eat more fruits and vegetables, find movement that feels good for your body, stay active, find uh, ways to get better sleep, and, and really focus on prevention. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Matab. It's my honor to be here. This room is filled with absolutely beautiful people. Um, my one sentence would be, make it a priority to routinely and regularly practice self-care, whatever that means to you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm just so glad that nobody said what I was going to say, because I don't know <laughs> if I would come up with something else. Um, but the thing that I would always say to patients is ask. Always ask your doctor. If you don't understand anything, just ask. And if you feel like you can't advocate for yourself, always make sure that you have somebody else who's going to be that annoying person in the room who's going to ask and bug them and always leave the doctor's office feeling like you know what they told you and you know what's going on. Aren't they smart? I Okay, Rashmi, you have a wealth of experience working with older adults and their health care concerns. What would you say is the most important thing a woman can do to maintain her health after 65? After 65 or at 50, whatever the age it is, age is a number, how do we, ma how do we make it happen and how do we make it successful? So there are a few tips which I would want to share for an older adult, or I wouldn't even call it an older adult, just a geriatric population when we take care of. There are a few tips. So if I write them down on my list, first one is getting an annual wellness visit. That basically brings you back to summarizing everything you need to do. But I'll start with the first tip as eating healthy. Just like what Molly said, and now everybody will tell me that I took all their uh, guidance their discussions, but Eating healthy, bring, make sure that you have uh, legumes and uh, all colors in your plate and portions in your plate which will keep you healthy. Number two, it is about exercise. In some way or form or shape, 30 minutes of exercise on a daily basis, that really, really helps you stay healthy, prevent so many diseases, keeps your balance strong that you don't get falls, right? And that fall takes you to a, a downward trajectory otherwise. Number three is making sure you get your immunizations. So talk about those immunizations, whether it's for zoster wax, flu vaccines, tetanus shot. So there are a lot of list of immunizations which are needed at certain age, of, uh, age and stage, and we must keep up with those. The next piece is all the screenings besides uh, for the cancer screening, colonoscopy is so important. Getting your screenings and the mammograms. And I will tell, I cannot tell you every detail of all the screenings here, but screenings are very important. 
so that you could prevent and continue to remain and actively age gracefully. Then the next piece is seeing your doctor, which I said as an annual wellness visit. And I will also add in my tip here is, after annual wellness visit, you would be also taking care of yourself by, by making sure you have social in interactions so that your depression doesn't set you in. So make connections, make friends, create a new hobby or follow what you have as a hobby. And that hobby is very important because that keeps your mind motivated and stimulated. And then rest and sleep. Rest and sleep is very important for healing and also for our mental peace and also for preventing disease. Rest and sleep is very important. I'm going to make a joke here, but not, it's not a joke. Sex is also important at whatever <laughs> age or stage. I always say that in my, so please, 65 doesn't mean you cannot have that. And last but, la la last but not the least, I want to still say believe in yourself and make sure you take care of yourself, get your bone density scans and stuff like that. Thank you. We're going to slide to the right now and, and ask Dr. Pemberton. Uh, reproductive health is such a primary concern for women for most of our lives. Can you give us your best advice for women to maintain good reproductive health and to maintain our health post-menopause? So I'm just looking out at the audience to see what my demographics are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's, I'm going to jump and go backward first, um, just to follow on what Rashmi said. She's absolutely correct. I always tell my patients, if you don't use it, you lose it. <laughs> and it's simple. Um, I've said it many times before, and I'll say it again. If you don't lose it, use it, you lose it. Um, so it is part of your health. Um, it does go back to nutrition. We talked about the weight training when it comes to bone health. But when it comes to GYN health, um, every woman is different. Um, one thing we didn't discuss, and I'm sure um, our, our expert in pulmonology will also mention, smoking. A lot of the times when I have patients come to me talking about smoking, and, and that also goes for reproductive health, they like to say, oh, well, Dr. Pemberton, I don't have any issues with my breathing or lung cancer. And I said, I'm not going to waste your time telling you smoking causes lung cancer. Let me tell you about the GYN issues that come with smoking, and there are a lot. So a lot of people don't think it actually negatively affects them, but for women who are trying to achieve pregnancy, it's a negative effect. You're smoking your ovaries away. When it comes to menopause, you can increase your chances of going into menopause much earlier the longer you smoke, the heavier you smoke. Um, we know that it affects bone health. All of those things are generalized when it comes to reproductive health as well as health after menopause. So those are benefits. When I went back into nutrition and I made that comment, a lot of the times people come to me saying, I would like to get pregnant, I'd like to have a baby. They want me to give them a magic pill. There is no magic pill. Now, there are times you have underlying conditions that might need a little assistance, but many times when you come in saying, I want to achieve pregnancy, the biggest thing you can do is if you know that there are changes that need to be done in your nutritional habits or increasing your physical activity, you will find that just changing those messages to your body make a grand difference in increasing or enhancing your fertility chances. So that's why I said nutrition is still key. When I talk about my birth center, women who are considered low risk are women who have a con they don't have medical conditions that allow them to be in the birth center, but it also, we want to encourage and educate as well as empower about what kind of birth they can dictate in their lives and us supporting it, not dictating to them what their labor and delivery should be, but discussing, having a communication, but it also includes that nutritional aspect. You can't be eating junk food, drinking soda, smoking, and then think, I'm going to have a healthy pregnancy and delivery. These are the things that may have negative effects on maternal morbidity and mortality, not just the social aspects we, we could delve into a little bit later. Molly Fallon Dixon. Molly, in your work, you help children and families access healthy foods and incorporate healthy, nutritious foods into their diets. What is considered a healthy diet and what tips can you give us to maintain a healthy diet? And I have to insert this part too, and an affordable healthy diet, especially in these days. Absolutely. 
Um, and so I think what it really comes down to is, first of all, I don't like the word diet. I think it insinuates that it's a short term, right? And what we're talking about is healthy, long-term lifestyle change uh, and food habits and healthy eating choices that are sustainable. So there are two components that I really consider to be a healthy diet or a healthy eating plan. And that first one um, is really gonna be individualization. There is, you know, we're a room full of women and some men as well, but there, we all don't like the same foods, right? So suggesting that there would be a meal plan that fits all of our needs it's, it's just not existent. So individualization, which really also then encompasses one of those first things that we should be assessing, can I afford healthy food in the first place, right? Do I have the means to then cook a healthy meal at home? Maybe I'm working more with a microwave situation and I have limited refrigeration, limited storage. All of those things factor into how we can eat healthy. So that's why individualization is so important. And the second piece with individualization is recognizing that we all have a different cultural background. And if you are seeing any kind of practitioner that is telling you that foods that are traditional for your culture do not fit into a healthy eating plan, you are probably seeing the wrong practitioner because our cultural foods, they fit. All foods fit, right? There are some foods that we should be eating more of and some foods we should be eating less of or less frequently, um, but we can make them all fit into our lifestyle. And that second component to healthy eating is, I'm gonna go back to that word sustainability. Is this something that you can do long term? Or is this some sort of a crash diet, things that, um, you know, that kind of old school notion of, of crash diets and we're trying to get ready for that upcoming high school reunion or a wedding uh, when, when the goals are really short term, right? We want sustainable change, meal plans uh, and, and food that we can eat and a way that we can eat that fits with our work schedules and childcare, all of that. Um, that fits for the long term. So three, I have like three red flags that I kind of tend to, so th those are my tips for a healthy diet. And then what are our three red flags kind of for diets and, and eating plans that we might see out there or have friends encouraging us to try, but three red flags that it's something that we want to avoid. And the first one is when uh, you see a meal plan or some eating suggestions that tell you to cut out a food group, right? We have our food groups, they are there for a reason, they all provide us different nutrition and different vitamins and minerals, uh, macronutrients, micronutrients, things that our body needs. And so when we eliminate one of those, we are missing things that are especially important for us, especially as women, we'll see a lot of diets out there that discourage dairy um, and osteoporosis is a concern as we age. So we wanna make sure that we're including all of our food groups. That second red flag um, is, are they promoting a product? Are they telling you that you can achieve weight loss or you can achieve your health goals if you spend $49.99 on this product? <laughs> you know, so again, we don't, we don't need to have access to those kinds of specialty products. There is no magic pill, as Dr. Pemberton mentioned. So again, another red flag. And our third red flag is rapid weight loss, right? Healthy weight loss is really in the range of one to two pounds a week and no more than that. So anything that is promising you that in the next, you know, six weeks you're gonna lose 60 pounds, that should be a giant red flag for you. But those are my three tips, but make sure your healthy eating fits your lifestyle, it is individualized, and make sure it's sustainable, something you can do long term. Rebecca. We know that heart conditions can present very differently in women versus men. What should women look out for and what can we do to take care of our heart health? Thank you so much. That's such a great question and one that often comes up. And you know, when heart disease um, was first launched into self-awareness, the first advertisement for women was, how do you recognize heart disease in your husband? That was the first advertisement that was out there. And that was only back in like the 1970s. So it wasn't all that long ago. Um, it was only recently until the 2000s that we really started to have that awareness that heart disease can impact women just as much as men. And if you look around the room today and you look at the table where you're sitting, heart disease kills one in every four women in the United States. How terrible is that? Um, you know. To share a personal story, whenever somebody uh, that my mother knows is diagnosed with cancer, she calls me and tells me, I have never received one phone call that says, my friend got diagnosed with high blood pressure, or my friend got diagnosed with high cholesterol, and I'm a cardiac provider for the past 20 plus years. Um, there still remains that idea that heart disease is a man's disease, is out there and it's going to only impact those people that don't take care of yourself. 
So what did we do wrong to get heart disease? So how does it present? So in women, sometimes you won't have that chest pain that you see in the movies that people are holding their chest, that you have an elephant in your chest. You may have chest pain, but it may be discomfort or some pressure. There may be some nausea or vomiting. There may be very fatigue, tiredness. Now, we went around the room, how many people wake up in the morning and don't feel tired, right? If I woke up and not felt tired, I would think something was wrong with me. We you know, talked about it at our table, about good sleep habits. But those are kind of warning signs that your body's telling you something is wrong. Nausea and vomiting, um, that's a symptom that could be part of heart disease. Jaw pain, arm pain, back pain. So all those symptoms I'm saying, they're so vague that they could be, um, it could be anything. It could be nothing, or it could be something a little bit more serious. So how do we prevent it? How do we diagnose it? So the first thing is to what Rashmi was saying. We have to do that surveillance testing, that preventive. The good thing is that you can get your blood pressure checked today, and you can have your cholesterol checked today. So that's really first step. If you've never had that done before, we can take care of that today blood pressure. Um, as you grow older, your blood pressure increases, and it's much more difficult to keep it below that normal. That normal blood pressure is about 120 to 80. Some individuals may be a little bit higher, and some may be a little bit lower, but it's important to kind of do that surveillance over time. The other piece to do is cholesterol should be checked once every five years from the age of 18 if it's normal. So if it's normal, you're okay doing it once every five years. If we went around the room, how many of us would be compliant with that? I could tell you that I have not been, and I work in cardiology. Um, once it's not, once we diagnose that cholesterol is either borderline or a little bit high, then it should be, depending on what the level is and whether you're on medications, then it does get checked more frequently. As you grow older, it should be about every year that we do a fasting lipid profile. Um, so talk to your doctor about that. Talk to your provider about that. Talk to your town about that. A lot of the uh, community centers do annual screenings, and they'll do this for free. And it increases awareness. It increases um, preventing disease that's progressive. Uh, often, when we see people in our practice, and my range, you know, at Newark Beth Israel, we do all CART disease from the um, blood pressure screening, young, normal, healthy, just the uh, preventative visit, all the way to patients that need a heart transplant. We were, you know, we're taking the old one out and putting another one in. So all spectrum there. So what I want to say about that is no one's going to do it for you. Um, it's really going to have to be up to you to be your own advocate, to go out, to talk to your provider, to get the screening, and then get the help you need. We're all here for you. Be there for each other. Um, nutrition is super important, as is not smoking, getting good sleep, apparently having sex. Um, my, I, I think, I think, yeah. <laughs> um, it cuts the depression out. <laughs> Um, and that's also cardiovascular exercise, right? Yes. So just yes. make sure that, that, you know, you engage that as exercise. So it's all good. It's all good. But it is very, it is very important to do that. So when I'm often, you know, when I often look at statistics or I'm preparing, I always see that still today, in 2022, with all the technology, all the awareness, all, all that we know, Heart disease still remains that man's disease. It goes undiagnosed in women. Um, most, most heart transplants that we do across the nation is men. Uh, most of the time, women present later. Um, you know, there's this notion that if you have estrogen, it protects you, which is true, it's partially true. But it's still, you're still at risk. So after you go through menopause, that risk increases. And the, the death rate for women in heart disease didn't start to come down and be the same as men until after the 2000s. Think about that for a second. After all we know, it was only until recently that we were able to say that women and health disease is the same rate as men. So I encourage all of you to ask questions, talk to each other, um, maintain your heart. You only have one heart, so you have the health, healthy heart. If you don't have a healthy heart, you're not going to be able to do all those fun activities that you want to go ahead and do. Thank you.
Dr. Quintiliani. <laughs> there are so many concerns around COVID-19, the effects of this illness and the effects of the vaccine. Can you tell us what you've seen in your practice and what advice you give to those who are still considering and have not been vaccinated? I thought it was interesting that our table, all of us sitting there, everyone had a mask on and we didn't want to take it off even for the picture. <laughs> that said a lot about us. So tell us the answer to those so, questions, um, please. I, I got the COVID question, you know, because I'm the lung doctor and everybody thinks about COVID and the lung, but it's very important to recognize that, you know, in everybody's field here, it affects us just as much. You know, women's health, it's very scary in pregnant women. The elderly, you know, how many elderly people didn't get to see their families for months and years because of COVID, you know? Heart disease is very big in COVID patients. People who didn't have access to food because they lost their job during COVID or they were too scared to go to the shop. And not to mention the huge, huge mental health burden that um, COVID has caused as well, you know? So it affects all of us. Um, I saw, you know, in my practice, a, a wide range of things, you know, from the uh, big things in the ICU, you know, with people dying, to people in the clinic with uh, these long COVID sy symptoms six months afterwards, you know, and all the complications of having been in the ICU. So we saw a, a broad range of things, you know. COVID is still a new disease. It's still, we're still learning things about it every single day. And I think for people, health professionals and non-health professionals, that's confusing sometimes, you know, because you hear one thing one day and then it changes the next day. But, you know, things are evolving and we're learning more and more as time goes on. The vaccine in itself, um, understandably, had people concerned, you know, in the beginning because, it, again, it was something new. But what we know from what we've seen in the studies and since we've had it out for a few years is that it does reduce your risk of serious illness and being in the ICU. Um, and we do recommend that people get vaccinated. Um, and yeah, that's basically. I think we've come to that special time. First of all, thank our panelists so far. We, we, we missed one. Did I miss one? Behavioral health. Oh, oh we my. need to talk about mental health. <laughs> oh my God. Don't forget See? mental health. I went, I went batty and just completely forgot. I had a very special question for you too. And I, I can't find it. I can't remember what it was. I, see, I just went nutty. I just, what can I say here? Let's see here. Uh, uh, uh. So, <laughs> has mental health become even more important because all we hear about, forgive me for you know, putting mental health with this, but we hear about so many shootings. We hear about mental health being a part of the reason so many people are, forgive the phrase, going nuts, help me. So um, I actually brought some numbers with me because I think, and it's hard to, to hear it, uh, but I think it's important. Um, and I want to talk about that a little bit with statistics to kind of really draw a picture of the importance of mental health and mental health care. Um, we all in this room have a brain, therefore we all have mental health and it requires all of us to take care of it, to take care of our emotional and mental health. And oftentimes we don't, it's not prioritized. Um, some of the facts that I brought in that I wanna share, it's about suicide specifically. Um, in 2020, in America, suicide was the 10th leading cause of death. On average, 130 Americans died by suicide each day. That's one death per 11 minutes. 90% of those died by suicide had a diagnosable mental health condition at time of their death. And firearms accounted for slightly more than half of all those suicide deaths. So I know these numbers are, are hard to hear and picture, but I could guarantee everyone in this room have probably been affected and most likely have been affected by either yourself or a loved one or someone in your community or neighborhood being touched by depression, bipolar, 
um, anxiety disorders, stress-related and trauma-related disorders, um, and suicide. And in this case, it, you know, it, it, what you mentioned, shooting homicides. Um, the good news is that mental health conditions are oftentimes not only treatable, not only manageable, but even preventable if we start early. Um, if I had to identify one factor why in 2022 we're still talking about mental health and we're still talking about stereotypes and access to care and lack of it, I would say stigma still plays such a huge role in our communities. Um, and, and if I had to, you know, I have your attention here, I have to ask everybody what's one thing we could do to continue breaking the wall of stigma is, is it would be to make it your business to check in with each other. Genuinely ask each other, how are you? Um, when you have a friend or a sister or a neighbor who is isolating, who's not returning your calls, check up on them. Be curious. Um, you know, if, if I'm sitting in the bus and I see someone holding their chest or choking or looks really pale, I don't hesitate to ask them, what do you need? Are you okay? But oftentimes, if we're sitting in the bus um, or in the train and we see someone emotionally distressed, we see someone acting or talking strangely, we see somebody intoxicated, we pull away, right? We shy away from checking in with them. Um, and all of that really spe speaks to stigma. So talking about our feelings, as cliche as it sounds, talking about our emotions, our unresolved grief, our history of trauma, um, is a way to normalize that, is a way to just the way if I'm sitting down with my girlfriend and talking about, yeah, I went to the doctor and I got my labs and everything looks good, when was the last time that you sat with someone and talked about, yeah, I went to therapy and, you know, I'm feeling better and I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm picking up a new hobby and I'm making sure I'm doing my 20 minutes a walk. Uh, and we don't. We still don't have those conversations ingrained in our everyday life. It's still something very separate. Behavioral health is separate. Um, and oftentimes, unfortunately, we wait till we have... Uh, you know, we have an illness, we have a major depression disorder, or we have bipolar disorder, or we can't function anymore. You know, we lost our job, we lost our partner. That's when we go in to get help. But I advise everybody, I encourage everybody, don't wait till you have a big problem that's no longer manageable to go seek a therapist, to go see a psychiatrist. Start early, encourage your children, encourage your friends, encourage your parents to find a therapist, shop for a good therapist. North Beth Israel Medical Center has a huge behavioral health center. Um, we have inpatient, we have outpatient. Five years ago, we started our integration program where we're putting clinicians, social workers, and therapists in the um, medical offices with the doctor. So we're doing screening and we're trying to identify who's somebody that could benefit from uh, behavioral health services instead of waiting till somebody ends up in our emergency room in our crisis center. Um, and, you know, I want to kind of finish my answer um, with a question again is, what do you plan to do for your self-care intentionally and mindfully, regularly and routinely? Thank you so much for the things you've said so far. I know the people in the audience have questions. I have rules for you. <laughs> First of all, do not pretend that you're in a private office setting and that they're your doctors, okay? <laughs> we have a lot of people in this room, a lot of questions to get answered, and we have about an hour to do it in. So everyone's kind of going to be limited to just, you know, you know how to do, right? <laughs> I don't really have to say you can only ask one small, quick question, and rather than, you know, questions for you and your five relatives who didn't get a chance to come with you this morning. Uh, so we're going to, you know, try and shorten the time as much as possible. I didn't get a chance to ask all the questions I wanted to ask, you know, so therefore you can't get to ask all the questions you want to ask. So when you want to ask a question, just come right up to the microphone, ask it. Go back to your seat and wait on an answer. That's a nice way to do it, right? And the quicker we get it done, the quicker we can all just thoroughly enjoy hearing from our guests some more. 
I wanted to ask some more questions about COVID, and I had a whole lot of questions for the mental health person. And you know the person down there on the second to the right, you know. <laughs> you know, swipe to the right, swipe to the left. I mean, you know, we all wanted to ask about that. So who wants to be the first person to ask a question? Come right up to the microphone. Please give us your name, ask a question, take your seat, and wait on the answer. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gwen Bynum. My question is to Dr. Pemberton. Um, we're in an age where marijuana is now legal. What would we tell our young people who are will, wanting to have children but think that, you know, this drug is not a drug that will affect me in the long term? That's a great question. I've had a few patients who actually came to my office pregnant. And because the most common symptoms that they experience in the first trimester is nausea and or vomiting, they will say to me, well, Dr. Pemberton, I've started smoking marijuana and it really helps my nausea and vomiting. And I'm like, that's wonderful when you're not pregnant. Now, I don't have any, no, there's no studies that say marijuana is what we call teratogenic. That's a fancy term for saying that the baby might end up having some um, defects um, when they're developing inside mommy's womb. But we don't know all the effects that marijuana may have on a developing brain. Um, what it may have when it comes to cognition and how they perform in school or attention, if they have attention deficits, things like that. So for me, it is really hard to tell a woman, hey, this works for you and you have to stop taking it. I'd rather find other ways that I know may not cross or potentially affect her baby's developing brain, um, even though I know that marijuana, yes, it's legalized, but I still would say I would refrain from using it at the time of pregnancy. It's not even a last resort for me. I will do everything I can to help them in that moment, but, and I always tell people, I'm really just an, a professional extractor. I'm only there to help when and it will be an obstetric situation, I'm taking care of two people at once. So my goal is to make sure I can keep both the mommy and baby healthy at the same time. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Diane Robinson and I had a quick question. Dementia in my family is so prevalent. It, it, my mother is 92, going 93. She has early dementia. I have two aunts that passed away, they had dementia. What can I do so I don't get it? That's my fear. That's my concern. So it, the dementia in the family, if it is a hereditary, then you know that there is some trend in your family. So getting early assessments. And as I said, that getting your screenings done where the doctors, when you see a geriatrician, and I, I'll let you know that we are going to be opening our geriatric health center at Newark Beth very soon. So there, will, there is a providers who are very much trained in managing those dementias and also identifying it early on. There are depression leads to dementia, there is alcoholism which leads to dementia as well, and all the heart disease what we just talked about. All that heart disease actually continues to create plaques in the brain which causes dementia. So for us to maintain that, we need to get our annual screenings done. We, at the age of 60 or 65, start losing our vitamin B12 and folic acid. So those vitamin deficiencies can also mimic as a dementia. So you need to see the doctor and start working with the doctor to evaluate those. If you are starting to have forgetful moments or you're just forgetting some words or names, or, and there, there are signs which will lead us to there. So getting those assessments done by a geriatrician is very helpful. Uh, good morning. My name is Annie. I have a thyroid problem that I lose weight. So being African-American, trying to eat health is hard, but I stay hungry all the time. So I'll deal with what to eat anymore. Absolutely. Oh, I'm going to take that one. <laughs> um, absolutely. So I think if you're feeling hungry all the time, where we really want to go to is fiber. Fiber helps keep us full and it can carry us from one meal to the other. So, and when I talk about fiber, we're talking about fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. So, and really a key to get a little extra boost of fiber when it comes to things like fruit, 
Uh, think of the skin on an apple or the skin on a pear. Include that. Don't peel that off. And, you know, that's also, like, really hard with kids because they always want to take that off. But, you know, the more you can encourage uh, yourself and family members to keep the skin on some of those fruits, they're going to get that extra boost of fiber. When we're looking at whole grain products, um, what you would be looking for, if you look on that nutrition facts panel, look under the carbohydrate section, you will see dietary fiber. And we are looking for at least three grams of fiber or more per serving. So, and when I'm talking about that, we're talking bread products, like bread, your cereals, uh, whole wheat pastas, brown rice, things like that. We want three grams of fiber or more per serving. And that fiber is really gonna help to keep you full, to carry you from one meal to the next. Um, and we want to make sure we're incorporating any snacks we're having to help keep us full, make sure we're really incorporating fiber in there as well. We have a question over here. Yes, good morning. Yes. And thank all the panelists for being here this morning. My question is to Rebecca Kane. Could you please ex um, explain the new cardiac physical therapy component Explain the, the hospital? Yes. A cardiac rehab? Yes. Okay. So um, we have an excellent program for cardiac rehabilitation and cardiac prehabilitation. So there's just two parts. The first part is, let's say that you have a different disease and you need to have surgery or you need to undergo some treatment. Um, that program is designed to help you get into the best possible shape to undergo whatever that surgery is or whatever that event is going to be. So what, um, what our therapists do is they tailor the program individually to you. So they'll do an assessment and they'll um, do almost like a personal trainer, like if you were at the gym, and they'll gauge to see where you're at and they'll create a plan for you that it will be progressive. So not all of us can start at the same level. Then if you, let's say that um, you had some sort of event and you were in the hospital, or you didn't even have to be in the hospital, depending on what it was, you maybe had um, a cardiac event and you needed cardiac rehab after the event to get you back into shape. They do the same thing. Usually the first visit is um, an assessment of your, where, where are you personally at? How far can you walk? How much can you lift? Um, you know, some patients may start where they can't walk half a block, but with the rehab component of it, they tailor the program for you to start doing a little bit more each time, a little bit more each day. It starts very much where you have a one-on-one. -on -one. They are with you throughout the whole time that you're there. Then as you get a little bit stronger, that one-on-one -on -one becomes a little bit less. Maybe now they're only with you for a portion and you're doing some independent work. Um, then after you finish the first phase of the cardiac rehab program, you go into a phase two program where you're still going to the center, but you don't have that one-on-one. -on -one. You're part of like a group setting. And then the phase three is you're pretty much doing it on your own. The, programs are tailored to help you understand what exercises you can also do on your own because rehab doesn't just happen in the one you know hour session that you go to the hospital it happens throughout the day how do you sit here and flex your you know your legs so you can get some circulation going that sort of thing is what rehab is about that's the physical part of rehab then there's a component for the nutritional part of rehab, because if you had surgery or um, an event, a good nutrition just helps you heal. It helps that inflammation process. I don't know if Molly wants to expand on that a little bit in terms of nutrition when you need to rehabilitate. Um. No, just in general. Oh, oh, just in general. Yeah, so just in general, it's really going to be about more progressing post-surgery um, how, and how you can really tolerate um, your new diet. Uh, tour, you know, and again, approaching something that incorporates those cultural foods, incorporates um, the foods that we like to eat to kind of get us back to something that feels normal, but making sure that now, you know, if it is not something we were doing before, we're focusing on our portion sizes, we're focusing on incorporating all of our food groups, uh, focusing on fruits and vegetables and making sure that that's a highlight of the meal. Okay. okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, ladies. Uh, you look very powerful up there, and I appreciate being in here 
and um, to hear you and your advice on everything that involves women's health. I thank you for doing that. My question is for Dr. Pemberton and any of you who would like to chime in. Several women are encouraged um, through gynecological issues to do hysterectomies. I'd like to ask uh, what is it that does, uh, causes the issues? What are the issues that women would have that would require a complete hysterectomy? And what are the effects, the long-term effects, after having done one? Excellent question. I spend a lot of time in my office trying to educate on the names or nomenclature of hysterectomies. A lot of the times when a woman does need a hysterectomy, they're scared because they're concerned that it's going to change who they are. And of course, the internet, Google, um, is excellent for information, but it can be a information superhighway. It may not be able to cater what you need to know for your body and your situation. So first and foremost, as most commonly known amongst women like us, fibroids. That's many times the most number one cause or the symptoms that come as a result of fibroids. Um, endometriosis is another condition that can lead to painful periods, change in bleeding, painful sex, or even infertility. These are multiple conditions that, or benign conditions that can lead, for women, lead to women needing a hysterectomy. What's important to know is, first and foremost, if you do need a hysterectomy, first, how old are you? Are you experiencing any symptoms of menopause? And if you are not, the goal should not be, and we've mentioned it before, when it comes to estrogen, still having some cardio protection, if you are young enough to require hysterectomy, the goal is not to place you into surgical menopause by removing your ovaries. So I'm gonna to try to go briefly without getting too confusing here. A lot of people hear complete or total hysterectomy, and they think it involves removing their ovaries. Be clear, you have your uterus, you have the cervix, you have the ovaries, you have the fallopian tubes. Those are the four main organs when it comes to the reproductive system. And when we're talking hysterectomy, Hysterectomy just means your uterus. That's it. That's all it is. It has nothing to do with your ovaries. So when people hear that, be, and, and you'd be right in saying, previous years, many times uh, OBGYNs will remove everything. You could be 35 years old and have fibroids, and they're in menopause because they removed their uterus, their cervix, the ovaries, and the fallopian tubes. And we have changed, uh, according to our um, OBGYN guidelines, to kind of make some, try to discuss where a woman is in her life to justify whether or not the ovaries should or should not be removed at that time she needs this definitive surgery. When your ovaries are removed, if you have not experienced symptoms and signs of menopause, you will if those ovaries are removed. But it's not where you will go into menopause if just your uterus removed, and that's what a hysterectomy is. So when we say total hysterectomy, it just means the uterus and the cervix that is attached to it is all coming out. It has nothing to do with your ovaries. If I say a partial hysterectomy, people think partial means, oh, well, you're taking my uterus, but you're leaving my ovaries behind. And I've just explained. Hysterectomy just means your uterus. Co complete or partial, total or whatever use terms we use, has nothing to do with your ovaries. So if your ovaries have to be removed, we're talking about a different type of surgery or something that's involved in your, whatever your case is, whatever your care is. But a complete or total hysterectomy just means your uterus and your cervix have been removed and your ovaries are left behind. So we just kind of mentioned a few most commonly fibroids and endometriosis. There are a few others out there, and that's excluding cancer. Thank you. Talking about uterus, ovaries, and all that, and I thank you for bringing the question out and the statement about sex. If you go into monopause, people assume that you no longer need sex, and that's not true. In my case, going to monopause, hot flash, and still sexual active, and don't have a mate. <laughs> I 
as a Christian, I'm suppressing, waiting until I get a mate. I'm 58 years old. I have not seen any. What can I do? Either to suppress it or find another way. Am I really supposed to answer that question? <laughs> I never encourage a woman to suppress. <laughs> if your hormones are working enough to still give you a sex drive after menopause, God bless you. You are blessed. <laughs> and so, no, I can't help you with the finding of the mate though, but... <laughs> But definitely, no, I don't make any recommendations for suppressing hormones at that time or suppressing the feelings that come with having a sex drive. It's anything, it's one of the more, I guess, more disconcerting emotions that a lot of women come to when it's saying, I want to be, but I don't have the desire to be. I rather just live like priest and nun or however your partner might be at that moment, you have no desire. That's a very tough, that's what we call a hypoactive sexual um, desire disorder, and it's really a, a hard condition sometimes to treat because we are, we are complex sexual creatures, and we not just we, you know we don't need just a little bit of friction or a pill to get to where we need to go. And sometimes you know your partner could say the wrong thing earlier that day. You're like you're not getting any none, none tonight. Um, <laughs> that we just are just complex that way. But it, I, there's no way I'm going to make that encouragement to suppress. Um, that drive if you do have it. Um, it's just finding ways to be able to channel that energy. And it may be being able to, and not to be crude or anything, just be able to please yourself in that moment. If you have to until that partner comes, there's nothing wrong with being able to do so. Okay. When I said you, if you don't use, use it, lose it, it didn't necessarily require another individual. <laughs> We have another question down on this end of the auditorium. Hi everyone, my name is Victoria Smith. In 2014, I had a massive heart attack. So I had a pacemaker. Go ahead, uh, speak, speak closely into the microphone. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, in 2014, I had a heart attack and I had a pacemaker which became infected. So, you know, I went through the surgeries and the medicine and all this stuff. Now I can't think of the numbers that they say, yeah. I know he said they have to be at 50. But doing the medicine, everything, it keeps going back and forth, back and forth to the point now they're talking about putting another device back in. So what do I have to do to, you know, keep it focused and balanced so it don't keep flossing back and forth and just remain the same? Wait, I, we didn't get the whole question. So a pacemaker mm -hmm. got infected. Mm -hmm. um, it was treated with antibiotics. They, re they removed it. They removed the whole mm -hmm, thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what was the second part the of the second question? The second question is, um, I forgot the number, but you know they say you have, your numbers have to be at 50 to, in order for you not to get the, the pacemaker put back in. So we were through the medications and everything, but now he's saying the number's going back and forth. It's not remaining at the balance number it's supposed to be at. What, what numbers are going back and forth? Um, the Heart rate? Yes. Okay, so, so a pacemaker is a device that is placed into the heart that um, when the heart rate goes too low, the, the pacemaker takes over and beats it for you. So there's some patients that may have different um, arrhythmias, which is an abnormal heart rhythm. So very common, it's one that's called a tachybrady. And that means that the heart rate goes really fast and you may feel that as palpitations, and then it goes abnormally low, which you may feel that as passing out. There's also times where you can have pauses and if, you, if your heart is pausing, then you're not getting the, the, heart, the blood pumping out, so you may pass out. That's, those are the type of symptoms. The challenge is that we can give you medication to bring the heart rate down, and we do a great job doing that, but sometimes it's too much medication that brings it down too much, and then you end up passing out. So 
That's, I think, it's what's happening. The heart rate goes up, we give medications, it goes too low, then you start to have symptoms. So we take off the medication, then it goes back up, and you're kind of in this roller coaster back and forth. Um, those are electrical issues of the heart. So the heart has a plumbing issue. That's when you end up having plaque buildup and electrical issues. And that's when the beating comes in the electricity. Sometimes we can do what's called an electrophysiology study. And that is sort of a map that we go in and we map out the heart to see where this electrical activity is coming from. Um, where is the short circuit? And we can burn that area out and then may fix the problem. But sometimes it's not as easy as that. Sometimes it depends on a whole other different reasons. So when a pacemaker gets infected and we can't treat it with antibiotics and the, and the last resort is to remove it and take out the pacemaker and the leads that go with it, um, most of the time, once a period of time goes by, we often have to put a pacemaker back in. It's just a matter of when that timing is right because we don't want it to get reinfected again, right? Because it's a foreign body, it's inside your body, it goes and it um, is as that. So in order you know, to be able to find that, that level, you have to find what is the underlying cause that's causing the heart rate to go up or down. Is it other medications that you're on? Is it, um, so it's a hard question to answer because it's a very individualized question. So my suggestion would be that you would need to see a cardiologist, but more importantly, a cardiologist that specializes in the electrical activity of the heart, and that's an electrophysiologist. And they could be able to do run some testing and see what is the, the, the appropriate treatment for you. Um, there's no pacemaker, per se, that's outside the body. We only have that to provide shocks to the defibrillator. So oftentimes, Really, the only way to treat this is by putting the pacemaker back in after all the infection is clear and there's no indication that you can get, re, you know, that it get reinfected. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Next question. Good morning, everyone. My name is Betty Bynum. I just want to know, has there been a study about COVID taking your appetite that you don't want, don't want to eat anymore? So they've done, uh, actually a study came out recently about uh, what we call, I don't know if you've heard the term, like long COVID symptoms, where people after they have recovered from, symptom, uh, from COVID have had all these kind of stranger symptoms, you know, like shortness of breath and chest pains and things like that. I can't say that I've heard that about the appetite specifically in the study that I saw, but there definitely are, th as I said, you know, we're learning about this all the time, but in our clinic, we have people that come and uh, tell us all sorts of symptoms that they feel after COVID. Whether they're attributed to that or not, I guess over time we will find out more and more. And I'll just add in for that lack of appetite piece. You know, we have really great resources in our clinic at North Beth uh, to see one of our dietitians who could kind of work with you a little bit more on that, um, kind of figure out maybe any underlying issues that might be going with that lack of appetite um, and, and kind of work through it to make sure that you're not losing too much weight um, and that you know, you're able to enjoy food again. I'm not losing weight, but it worries me. I'm a eater and I, I eat breakfast all the time. But now if I don't eat, it doesn't bother me. I can go all day and don't eat and it doesn't bother me. And I know it's not good. Yeah. It's definitely something you should uh, bring up with your doctor when you see them next, you know, because it could be a multitude of different things. So they would have to do you know, ask you questions, examine you, and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I do, I do want to say one thing about COVID. Um, you know, we have an excellent clinic, and we work together with the pulmonary division, but there's a tendency that whenever something is coming up now, it's because of COVID. And I, I want to caution everybody about that, and not only in your health, but in everything else, because, you know, it may have nothing to do with COVID, it may be that there's something else going on that it's not being diagnosed because everyone's like, oh, must be COVID. So I just, I just kind of want to bring that up for a point of discussion for everyone to think about it. And if you're seeing a doctor and you, know, you bring up lack of appetite for that one example, and the, you know, the attitude is more like, oh, it must be because you had COVID two years ago, 
you know, my suggestion is have further discussions, ask and, and say, no, you know, let's, if, if COVID didn't exist, what else could this be? And start that discussion and see where that leads you. We have a question on that end. Before we have our next question, I'm just gonna ask everyone that steps to the mic, just speak up a little louder and all of our panelists hold the mic closer because it's a little bit hard to hear in the back. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Mary Beckwith. I have a question about uh, geriatric health, health uh, center, okay? I am at an age where I don't know whether I'm supposed to stick with the, uh, the caregivers that I have or am I supposed to, because of my age, um, switch over to a geriatric uh, center and I just, I just wanted to know, how do you determine what to do? So geriatrics is not a special disease or something. It's the multiple conditions when sometimes when you see a medical doctor and you may not be having enough time with that primary care doctor who could answer all your questions. As we grow, there are multiple complex diseases, like we have arthritis, we have bladder uh, incontinence, we have memory questions, and so the geriatricians are very well trained to integrate all these components of your discussion and ma make sure that managing that patient's comprehensive health in a geriatric clinic is much suitable. I'm not trying to lure away everyone to go leave their doctors and now go to a geriatrician, but just like when you have a medical doctor and you definitely want to have a further consult sometime, then you can always ask and see a geriatrician as well. It's another consulting uh, service, even in the hospital. And then, yes, sometimes the patients, when they become very complex, the primary care doctors itself says, I think you could be managed with a geriatrician now. And that's where, that's a conversation for you to have with your doctor. And also having a consult with a geriatrician would not hurt because they can, you know, ask you a lot of things about your functional capacity, about your executive functions, memory disorders, fall prevention techniques. So that's what the geriatrics is. I hope you answered your question. Thank you. We have a question on this end. Good morning. My name is Ann Bozier, and thank you all for being here. Um, a recent diagnosis of a family member was first degree arterial ventricular block. Can you explain what that is and what we should do uh, beyond this? So first degree atrial ventricular block is when the electrical activity between the top part of the heart and the bottom part of the heart takes a little bit longer than you would expect. It is nothing bad, it's pretty benign. A lot of people have it that they don't know that they have it. Doesn't usually cause any symptoms. So think about it where there's a road that goes from the top of the heart to the bottom of the heart, and now there's traffic on that road and it's taking a little bit longer than you would expect. The only time that you would worry is when you start to have blocks that go into your second degree or your complete heart blocks because that means that the electrical activity which is was causing that heart to squeeze is not it's not doing that it's not in sync and that's when symptoms start to occur but if it's just first degree AV block we diagnose that via an EKG everyone that goes to the doctor at least once a year should have an EKG if you have heart disease or if you have high blood pressure or other symptoms, it should really be at each doctor's visit just to make sure that there's no changes. Um, and you, normally there's, there's time that we would expect that electrical activity to take. And when it takes a little bit longer than we would expect, we diagnose it for first degree AV block. If all of us in this room did an EKG right now, some of us would have AV block that we wouldn't even know about, and we wouldn't do anything about it per se, unless it progresses to something a little bit more um, it, it, that would cause symptoms. So there's some medications that can also cause a slowing of that electrical activity, 
So if you've never had this block before and all of a sudden it shows up, it would be worth to look at what medications are you taking, what over-the-counter, don't forget those, a lot of my patients forget that, what over-the-counter medications are you taking, what supplements. Because remember, a lot of vitamins and supplements are not regulated by the FDA, so you, there may be things in there that you may not know about that may cause other things. Um, but for purposes of just being a good old-fashioned first-degree AB block from the cardiology world, um, we don't really worry about that too much. Thank you. We have a question down here. Yes. Oh, this is for Dr. Pemberton. Um, I was going to go to the gynecologist. I'll talk to one of my friends. I said, well, I got to go to the gynecologist. And she says, well, you're still married. We're still having sex, Sharon. So you go. She said, I don't go anymore because I'm not having any, no sex anymore. And that blew my mind. You know, she feels like she don't have to go anymore because she's not having sex and because of her age. Uh, great question. Uh, well, it wasn't a great statement, actually. Um, a lot of times I've had patients who didn't feel they needed a gynecologist because they finished having children or they don't need to see the gynecologist anymore because they had a hysterectomy. But many times um, as a gynecologist, I do straddle the fence between primary uh, and specialist. And a lot of the times I'm some women's primary care doctor. Now, I don't in any way, shape, or form try to pretend that I will know how to manage cholesterol or high blood pressure or heart disease. Um, those are things that may be above my pay grade, but at least I'm the initial person they see for GYN health, uh, breast health, um, as well as just getting the basic um, labs that start with checking your cholesterol and checking your diabetes and checking your thyroid. So we do annual visits, and those annual GYN visits are inclusive of those same tests. So it has nothing to do with age or childbearing or menopause or, or hysterectomies. We do recommend still seeing your GYN um, for that GYN health. In the middle. Hi. Good morning, ladies. And uh, I just want to thank you all. Oh, am I not on? OK. Hi. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. And thank you, ladies. Thank all of you for um, participating in this forum. My question is for um, Ms. Ayatoli what, on the uh, mental health aspect of things. You mentioned that you um, partnership with other agencies uh, and other outside agencies. Well, I work at a school that's near um, your facility. And um, are there any partnerships that you are offering or available to work with our students who are in desperate need of um, you know, services because uh, since the pandemic, we've um, observed aberrant behaviors in our students, and it's just very alarming and concerning. So that's my question. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, and actually, being in the emergency room and in the crisis center, I've also seen an increase in the amount of referrals of children that we're getting compared to maybe two, three, five years ago. So there is definitely something happening where children are more in need for behavioral health and mental health care um, for various reasons. Um, so, North Beth Israel has, we actually have a children's outpatient clinic where we provide therapeutic services, case management services, and medication management with our doctors. Um, if you, the number that's provided right under my name um, in that folder, that's actually the number to our outpatient clinic. Um, I could also touch base with you offline here and kind of give you some contact information. But Newark Beth Israel has a big service for children. So, uh, uh, and perform care is usually, uh, you know, we work with them very closely to get children in for services and assessments. So I hope, I hope that's helpful. I just want to add to that. So I am the Vice President of Community Relations, and so we do go out into the community and partner with the schools, and then I have the Director of Social Impact and Community Investment, who has a partnership with all of our schools here in, the great, in Newark, in the greater Newark area. So we will definitely have you connect with either one of us that we can get the services that are more generic out, and then when you need specific, get you to our behavioral health programs. We have a question on that end. Hi, good morning. I just want to say, oh, okay. And please it's speak a, loudly into the mic. 
Okay, good morning. It's an honor to be here today and to share this wonderful day with you wonderful women in healthcare. Thank you again for taking the time out, for coming out and talking with us, because I know you could be doing your charting. <laughs> so I want to say thank you. My question is to Dr. Matab. Um, with all that's going on now in the school systems, with the sh school shootings and everything, it, it has really affected our much, much younger generation of kids, um, whereas it only affected more so the older generation. But how do you begin to open up, the, as a parent, open up the discussion at home to speak to our little ones about um, what's going on in the schools and what's going on with like their, what they're seeing on TV or what they're hearing about to make them feel more comfortable about even going back to school or going into the classrooms without being afraid that it's gonna happen to them? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Um, it really goes back to normalizing these conversations and as adults modeling that for our children and younger generation. So in our household, talking about how are we really feeling, talking about fear, talking about anger, um, also introducing and normalizing therapy instead of again waiting till there is red flags or warning signs, introducing the concept of therapy, counseling services to our children, um, just like we would encourage them to go get their eyes checked out annually or go get their um, teeth cleaned out every six months or get annual work with, the, with their medical doctor to do really the same thing for behavioral health and counseling services. Um, I think one thing that schools are working towards to do even more and better work in is providing those behavioral health counseling services and standardizing that care instead of, again, waiting till there is an issue. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to these shootings and, and, and what's been happening, there, there's been warning signs that we've been ignoring and we've been brushing under the, under the rug. Um, and now it's created a lot of fear and anxiety for our children to be in school, which is where to, you know, for a lot, a lot of our children is the safest place sometimes. Um, and it, it, that's kind of changing for our children and for our parents. Um, so I would advise us as parents and as adults to model those conversations and check in with our children, talk about depression, talk about anxiety, um, and model those, th those conversations that we, wa we want to see our children having and normalizing it. Our next question. Hello, uh, my name is Thomasine Watts. Uh, Dr. Kane, could you please answer this question for me? Uh, my sister is on the LVAD machine, heart machine. Could you please explain that to me? She's uh, complaining about the weight of it. Uh, she has, she's having a problem with the machine. Sure, I, I'll take that question. Um, thank you. So, uh, left ventricular assist device, which we call an LVAD, it's a, oh, sorry, um, it's a machine that we can call, we can say it's a heart pump. So, it's a surgical um, implant. It's only for patients who have end stage heart disease that may or may not be eligible for a transplant. The machine itself um, is implantable, and it, there's a wire that comes out of the abdomen that plugs in to a machine that has batteries attached to it. So it does have a little bit of weight to it. It, it has about five to 10 pounds that they must carry all the time. So just picture yourself carrying five pounds every single second of the day. Um, so it can get heavy. There's ways and there's little um, tricks that we can provide for her. Um, we have like a purse type that you can put across your body. We also have some biker shorts that can, can go into like with the leg. It all really depends on, on the person, so it's very individualized. Um, the, the machine sometimes gets plugged when they sleep into the wall. So, so that is the only time that they're not carrying the weight is when they're laying down or sitting down and they're plugged into a wall um, unit. Um, but if they're up and about or they're walking around, then it is, it is the batteries. So the batteries is what it weighs. 
that weighs that has that weight to it. There's really no other way to have it. It's not that they have to have this machine connected at all times because that's what's providing that electrical activity for the heart to pump. Um, and without it, the heart wouldn't function. So, you know, I would encourage your sister and you to talk to the doctor about ways to, to maybe make that machine be part of the body weight, you know, whether it is with uh, not so much a purse that goes across your chest, but maybe um, like a like biker shorts that can go in there so it's not as heavy in one area, changing it from one side to the other. Sometimes that's not comfortable for patients, so if they're righty, they're used to one side, if they're lefty, the other side. But those are type of, of ways that, that we sort of help our patients carry it. The other piece of it is um, doing some exercising to increase their strength. So we always have patients lift weights or waters just to try to get that strength up, so then carrying the machine all the time is not as burdensome for them. I hope that answers your question. On this end? Okay, so I'm so thankful that we're back during the Women's Health Day. So I have a question to the entire panel. Um, so as women, right, we all, you know, eventually get to that stage where the body starts changing. Some women, my grandmother used to call it, Lord rest her soul, and my mom, you know, the change of life, the menopause thing, and, you know, so I'm starting to approach that phase, right? And you go through a lot mentally, physically, a lot of different things that your body, your mind, everything starts to go through. And I've had, with my experience, sometimes I'll ask someone who is more senior than myself, you know, like, how did you deal with this? And to some women, it's like, oh my God, like taboo. Like people will look at you sometimes strangely. Like, what are you talking about? So is it possible for the Beth Israel to maybe start, um, I'm not quite sure what you would call it, like a support kind of thing or a network where women can come together maybe monthly or whatever to just Kind of like, you know, Weight Watchers. You get together, you talk about things. There are parent groups. What about a, I don't want to say Golden Years kind of group, because then that sounds like the Golden Girls, but like, wouldn't that be awesome? Because that would encompass mental changes, physical, emotional, the sex stuff you can talk about, just all of that. Wouldn't that be, like, is that possible? So I, I'll, I'll say that aging gracefully is the key and how we want to do that is by, uh, first thing I said was be socially interactive with other people and your friends so that you could get the information and knowledge from others. So we have Reverend Ron Wellness Center mm -hmm. where we have variety of those programs where we have a caregiver support pro program, where we have a program on okay. how to make the healthy cooking and I'm gonna have Molly talk more about that. There are programs at Newark Beth Israel which supports community. We bring people. We, uh, I, I'm sure Denise Clark is here. She runs our Home Friends program. She runs a lot of uh, support groups with caregiver, a rookie club, a Romeo club, where we're going to bring all the men and sit and talk about things. So we do have that, and I think I will have Molly to explain a little bit more on that services. Yeah, definitely. So uh, at the Reverend Dr. Ronald B. Christian Community Health and Wellness Center that Rashmi mentioned, which is located right across the street from the emergency room at the Beth, uh, we do have a variety of programming. Um, we don't necessarily have something typically uh, to that title, but I can tell you that our average participant, I know a lot of you ladies are here in a lot of our programming, they are in that age demographic that you're talking about. Um, and I can tell you we always digress from whatever the topic planned was. Um, so, you know, feel free. Uh, one of the classes that I think you would really benefit from would be our Thursday Healthy Lifestyles program, mm -hmm. uh, which does certainly have a nutrition focus. It's led by Karen Basedow, one of our uh, certified diabetes educators. Mm -hmm. She's doing uh, a class in the afternoon if you're able to go visit with her. Um, but she, uh, her class, you know, again, it is a nutrition focus, but they tend to digress from that. Um, and a lot of just really emotional support, women supporting women and uplifting each other. So I think that would be a great place to start. We also have a senior wellness connection program, which meets every Monday morning uh, virtually. We're still, you know, in still in that pandemic mode, um, but we meet virtually every Monday. So that would be a great resource as well with a variety of topics. We always have different experts from the Beth on there uh, speaking about their area of expertise. 
So, and for more information on the Reverend Ron Christian Wellness Center, just right outside either that door or that door uh, is our wellness table. We've got our full calendar of events for the month of June, contact information, um, and just so you can find out more information about all the different programming that we have going on at the Wellness Center. So just really quickly, thank you so much. So if, maybe Dr. Pemberton could chime in also. I hope I'm not mispronouncing the name. But what I'm asking is, so you know, I know we have a lot of different programs. At the Beth, I've been coming here for years. I birthed like four children here, like almost 30 years ago. But can we start some sort of support thing specifically for this? for the women to talk about this, you know, just to come together and just kind of talk. I, I think it'd be a good idea. I think it's an excellent idea. I already, um, I am associated with Newark Beth Israel Medical Center. I am a former graduate um, over 15 years ago, um, but I am not directly involved with Newark Beth Israel as an employee, um, so therefore, I, I know that those are community um, discussions that can be had, should be had, and then I see she's raising her hand of things that can be created. Um, where I am um, and my practice at my birth center, do we do education classes? I think it's an amazing, amazing um, suggestion to have one that is not just age specific, but specific from that aspect, because that is a lot of, a lot of women gain a lot of um, insight on some of the symptoms they're experiencing, it makes them feel less alone. You know, you feel like, hey, I'm not the only one looking like I someone poured a bucket of hot water all over me in the bus stop, you know? Um, or just, you know, having a fan underneath the, the desk because you're experiencing severe hot flashes. Um, so I think it's an amazing, um, I love the fact that you had that suggestion and I'm sure our community uh, director could be able to start putting things like that together, at least accessible from the Newark Beth Israel um, uh, Medical Center aspect. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask who's, somebody must be leaning on the light switch, but if we can get the lights back up in the room, that would be helpful. <laughs> and absolutely, we are definitely um, in the community and inside of the walls. What we like to say all the time, healthcare just doesn't happen at our facility and that's why we go out into the community and make different partnerships. We do have providers in the community where we're going out and just having um, different discussions where people can just ask the provider. So if it's ask the pharmacist, ask the, the doctor or nurse or nutritionist, we have those type of programs at the, um, in the community. But this is the reason why we all come together at this space today so we can hear from you of what you would like to see in the community and how often you would like to see it. So again, at the end, we're going to ask you to fill out those evaluations. But I think it's so important, especially in these times now, that we are having some social spaces that we can share our like experiences and then talk to a professional at the same time. So thank you so much for that suggestion. The mic on the right-hand side. There we go. And don't forget to talk loudly into the microphone. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to speak to the lady that said her sister has the L band. Is she still in the room? Oh, she did. Okay, I want to speak on that. Uh, I wish she was in the room. Did you have a question for the guest on the um, stage? Well, another doctor in the red. What's Rebecca King. Yes. Because you're aware of this. Well, my mom is one of the patients at Beth Israel when they first introduced that, she was chosen. So her um, l band was a gift. But I wanted to say that for that person, please live your best life. Because as you know, once you get that l band, that's it, if you don't have a donor. And so I think the reality is that we should let people know, moving forward, the truth to live their life be as healthy as you can be, and just every day just pray that a donor does come through. My mom was blessed. Unfortunately, a young lady was in a car accident that one evening, and they called her right away. Within, she had her, um, her transplant within a year, and um, the team was excellent. It was like over 15 years now, and so when I heard it, it touched my heart because I know as you know, the l band is the last step in so many years, and I hope a donor comes through for the young woman's sister 
um, soon. But as for now, there was a woman, she used to go online, that made uh, b bags for, you know, for the battery holder when you're out and about. I don't remember her name. My mother's not home for me to get the information. But it should be online. And she handmade the bags. You put the order in. And maybe the hospital, you can reach out and give the information on your bulletin board or something about her. She was making homemade bags because, like you said, the L-band, those batteries are long and they're heavy. But the machine itself in the house, just having it in the house, and what comes with having that, um, um, my people, it's a stress because that's the life. You have to have it. It's on all day. It's on all the time. When you go out in public, I think it's four batteries, right? It's the four long batteries. You, if you're out and about, I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, just live your best life. It's a reality, and I think you should have a good community of truthfulness. Let them know. Thank you for that. Thank you. It is a great therapy we offer for patients that need it. We definitely work with patients individually to see what the best part is in terms of, you know, what type of bag or what type to use. Um, so thank you for that, you know. And it is, I just, I'm happy to say that we have a patient who just celebrated her 14th anniversary with a device, with a VAD, and she's doing amazingly great. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the therapies that we offer in Newark Beth Israel, and you're right, it, can, it really can provide a very meaningful life for those individuals that, that receive this therapy. So, thank you. In the center mic, and don't forget to talk loudly. Thank you. Real loud? Okay. Yes. My name is Rose. I don't really have a question, but I have a statement first that I, I have the best doctors, and they're all at Beth Israel. The only service I don't use at Beth Israel is yours, <laughs> and you can tell why. I remember, <laughs> remember you. <laughs> but other than that, I was, I'm, was suffering with anxiety because of two of my doctors. One was a GI and one was a surgeon, and they had me going crazy, and I called the health center around the corner from the hospital and I was given an appointment for three months down the road. When three months came and passed and I hadn't heard anything, I called back and they said, oh, we don't have your name on the list, but we can put it on the list. I had to say, no, thank you. I mean, I was already anxious because of these two doctors that they're frightened and I'm frightened. I know what's wrong, and like I said, I have the best doctors. I walk into a doctor's office and I say, um, I need help, and it was my cardiologist, and I spent five hours on the table in the cardiac center where they went in every artery, and she found three arteries that was blocked. First of all, we know our body better than the doctor know it. So if you don't advocate for yourself, you in big trouble. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Are the mic down here? Um, yes, it's a follow up to my previous question to Dr. Pemberton. Um, prolapse, prolapse uterus, prolapse kidneys and <laughs> livers. And um, at, after a hysterectomy, I was reading that there was a great possibility of having um, the prolapse of uh, the kidney and liver. Is that something that you could uh, share a little bit about? I think that's a little bit above my pay grade. I've not heard of kidney and liver prolapse. Um, are you talking about after hysterectomy? Yes. Mm, not f maybe as familiar with that level of prolapse. Um, in the way we used to operate, well, I shouldn't say we, <clears throat> when the way some doctors still operate or the way I used to operate when it comes to hysterectomies, um, there was, especially going back to what we said, the nomenclature of a total hysterectomy where the uterus and cervix were removed and only the, the vagina was left, or if the uterus is in place and the ligaments are starting to stretch, causing the uterus to, 
to almost make its way out like it's delivering a baby. Um, those situations, let's say after hysterectomy, um, in older techniques, sometimes the vaginal walls or the vault will prolapse and many times you'd have to get some what we call suspension type of procedures to kind of put them back. But I'm not familiar with other parts of the abdomen, which are much higher than right. where the uterus is located, being a part of that prolapse. I think a lot of women have concerns when it comes to hysterectomy that when the uterus gets removed, then everything else is going to start shifting and moving and slipping and sliding and knocking about inside the abdomen. And it really, it isn't. Um, even if your ovaries are left behind, they are, they are attached almost like a bridge. There's two parts of the where the ovaries connect to the walls of your abdomen on the inside and then to the uterus. When the uterus gets removed, the ovaries just stay on the side of the wall. They're not you know, slipping and sliding and flipping like a Ferris wheel. Right. Um, but as to liver and kidneys um, and other organs outside of the, the pelvic organs, no, I'm not familiar of that being a more increased chance after removal of the uterus for prolapse. All right. Thank you. One question left, and I see the questioner coming to the microphone. <laughs> Don't forget Good to morning. speak closely and loudly into the mic. Hello, ladies. How are you? Um, my name is Moselle Gary. Um, this is for uh, Dr. Quint Quintiliani. Quintiliani. Sorry. Um, I had COVID twice. Thank God I, I'm here. I still have long COVID, and it has affected my lungs. It's gotten worse. So what are the uh, new findings on the long COVID? Uh, and I am reluctant to take the second um, uh, booster because every time I get the vaccine and boost, I get sick. So what do you suggest I do? I do have a specialist, by the way, a pulmonary guy. Um, one of the most common symptoms that we've seen with long COVID is this kind of shortness of breath that happens afterwards. Um, and we always have to, you know, really kind of assess, you know, like uh, Rebecca Kane was saying, you know, whether it is COVID or whether it's something else. So we tend to, especially in a case like yours, go through everything, you know, because that shortness of breath, we may be, actually have things that can help you or things that you can do with it as well. Um, we've seen, you know, people with some heart conditions afterwards, some clots, different things like that. Oh, sorry. Um, but again, you know, each individual is kind of different and we have to assess them individually and work on it in that way. Uh, there was something else you asked, which I forgot. Um, the booster. Oh, the booster. Um, so um, you, if what we recommend is that everybody gets, you know, the first two shots and then the third booster, and then there's certain people that are recommended to get the, the fourth shot, which is your second booster. It tends to be people over the age of 50 or people who have other kind of chronic conditions. So if, you've had other, if you have other chronic conditions, then we still recommend that you get it. People do have um, symptoms after the vaccines. You know, it's normally for 24 hours, and then they tend to go away. Um, you know, most commonly are like the fevers and the body aches and things like that, but we don't really see uh, things much after 24 hours. Um, the other thing that uh, they saw when we st first started noticing these long COVID symptoms is that people who got vaccinated, it actually tended to help with those symptoms a lot as well. Um, so I would still recommend, you know, over the age of 50 to get the second one. Thank you so much again, ladies, for your excellent job. Thank you, audience, for your excellent job on keeping it short. Give yourselves a hand. And let's just sort of bow our heads for just a moment. Let us be grateful for the food that we're about to eat. And Think of those people who have no food. Think of those people as close as California who have to think about having less water. Think about the world we're in right now 
for unfortunately we see more lives lost where we have to mourn too much. But help us, Lord, first be more thinking about our own care and taking the information we've learned here today and sharing it with others. And help us to open our eyes and think about the people we know and even those we don't and just look upon them differently with kindness, thoughtfulness, and love. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Amen. It's lunchtime. Keep your place and please allow me. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for your time and patience. And actually, here in our panelists out, our esteemed panelists, may I please get another round of applause for these panelists here. I see people standing. This must mean we did a good job here today. This is so very wonderful, and I can't thank you enough for taking time out for yourself today. The theme that resonated across this stage today was self-care. And by being here today, you're acknowledging that it's so important, it's priority in your lives to be here, to hear more information about um, what's going on in women's health. So it may not have been something that pertain directly to you, but maybe your neighbor, maybe your daughter, maybe your mother, right? And so we want to make sure that we keep coming out to um, events like this to get the information, share the information, and also be able to advocate for yourselves to your providers, right? I can't thank our panelists enough. There were so many great things that were said here, and I don't know if she's still here, but Dr. Marilyn Harris was here um, and she's been over this program for so long in community um, relations. And I said, the one year I get to take it over, you guys are talking about sex and drugs, right? <laughs> Put me on blast, right? But it's such important information that we are sharing today. And again, I learned a whole lot from my colleagues. Every time I'm in front of them, I'm very impressed and I learn something more each day. And this is what we come here together for every day. So I want to give you some, a few housekeeping items. So if you just bear with me for one minute, I want to thank our esteemed moderator. When Brenda Blackman speaks, we all listen, right? And it's just um, so wonderful to have um, her here today. She was very gracious, and I know she has a great relationship with Lisa as well, but she was very gracious to be with us today. Um, and we want to thank you for always stepping up and speaking out around women's health and around health in general. And so we want to give you a cute little swag bag. <laughs> And I don't know where Lisa is, but there she is, waving her arms. Lisa said, Atia, you know, Brenda came here as a favor, and she's always here for the Beth. And so what the Beth would like to do to, for you is to make a donation towards the Kelly Fund for Lupus, Inc. So here you are. Thank you so much. <laughs> 